The coronavirus has redefined our normal. Many things we took for granted are gone. If we let the things that we lost define us, then we lost ourselves when we lost them. But the truth is, the things that really matter, that should truly define us, haven't been lost at all. Well, as you can see in the, the images in that video, it remind us that the coronavirus pandemic has redefined many different aspects of life. From our schools, where students would, would sit uh, in rows and they would receive instruction from the teacher up front, to now we have students that are online and having to take classes online through Google Meet, whether that's elementary students or college students. Even sports and leisure, think about sports going from those crowsy, cr crowded, crazy stadiums that were filled with screaming fans, and now we have stadiums, we have arenas, we have fields with just crickets. Also, area like shopping, you saw, you know, from crowded malls that people were, would scurry to on the weekends and throughout the week, and they would get whatever they needed, and now we have online shopping, and you have to order things and then go pick it up from curbside. Now, some of that is opening up in states like California and across the United States, but shopping has been redefined. And even services. I mean, who ever heard of what's an essential service and what's a non-essential service until the coronavirus pandemic broke out? And we even think about church services, worship services, the fact that, that we would normally gather indoors as one body, and now we're gathering online and even on campus outdoors like we are here at Shoreline today. And finally, how about social practices? Gone are the days of high fives and hugs and handshakes, and now we have social distancing and wearing of masks. I mean, whoever thought that socially distant would be a good thing? And I was reminded, uh, Cole, our worship leader, was sharing that he went to the bank recently and he was wearing a mask and he thought, just struck him that, that when could you ever go into a bank and wear a mask and be accepted. And so I just thought, it's so interesting how the coronavirus pandemic has really redefined so many different areas of life. And one thing in particular, I think that we also have to look at, it has also redefined for many people what success looks like. And I think for each and every one of us, whether it's through economic impacts or whether it's through unemployment or whether it's just through the health challenges or the slowing down of our country and of our world, it has really caused us to relook, and I would say probably for many redefine what success looks like. So I want you just to think about that. Where should we look to find a definition of success? I mean, just imagine in your mind, just picture, what does success look like to you? Is it material wealth? Is it prestige and power? Is it money? Well, here's the fact. If we look to the world to give us a definition of success, this is what we'll find, that we'll only find false promises. We'll see that material gain, it promises deep satisfaction, increased self-esteem, and internal happiness. But it can't deliver. Also, power and prestige, it promises acceptance. It promises love from others. But again, it can't deliver. And money itself, it promises inner peace, but it can't deliver, and it never has. See, worldly success makes promises that it can't keep, but the only, the only one who keeps his promises is Jesus. And therefore, Jesus alone should define what true success is in our life, because true success has only one source and one definition. And our definition of success then should align with the one who defines us, who created us, and that is Jesus. So today what I want to do is I want to spend some time today looking at Jesus and learning from Jesus the true, what is it that gives us true success in life. And to do that, I want to look into some of his farewell words to his disciples. I want to look to John 15, one of my favorite 
portions of Scripture in John 15. So I want to encourage you this morning as you, as you open up your Bibles, if you'd open that to John 15, we're going to be reading from verses 1 through 17 or open up your Bible apps. And as you're doing, just want to give a little bit of context before we get into the reading itself. You see, in John 15, we know that Jesus is resolutely heading to the cross. And John 15 takes place just after Jesus and his disciples have finished with the Last Supper. Jesus has washed the disciples' feet. And Jesus, in that process, in chapter 14 of the book of John, he tells the disciples that he's going to be departing, but that they would be remaining. And so imagine what was going through the disciples' heads. Imagine what they were feeling, the uncertainty of what was going on, what was going to happen. And Jesus is going to leave. What does that mean for us? We've invested our our whole life. We've we've followed Jesus for the last three to three and a half years, and now Jesus says he's going to depart. The uncertainty, the fear that they might have been feeling. And as we read these words today, as you listen to God's word, as you listen to the words of Jesus, for some of you today, maybe that's where you're at. A feeling of uncertainty, a feeling of fear. Let Jesus' words Just saturate your heart and listen as we read from John 15. We read in verse 1, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned." If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything that I learned from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other, love each other. I mean, there is a lot to unpack in those 17 verses, but I tell you what, we don't have time to unpack all of it. So what I want to really do today is I really want to spend some time really harvesting from Jesus and looking at really key, three key themes that we can see in there. But before we do that, I want to just kind of go through and say, why did Jesus choose this picture, this metaphor of the vine and the branches? Well, first of all, culturally, the vine the disciples would have known, because Jesus refers to the vine. In the Old Testament, the vine refers to Israel, the nation of Israel. And all throughout the Old Testament, as God would refer to the nation of Israel, like the vine, that we would see that the nation of Israel, its leaders and priests, always fell short. But now Jesus, in verse 1, says, I am the true vine. And so what Jesus is saying is where, where, where the nation, where the priests, where they've all fallen short of delivering on God's salvation for the world, I am going to fulfill that. I alone am the true, the genuine vine. Also practically, I mean, Jesus illustrated this very simple but powerful eternal truth 
And that was very relatable to the disciples because they would have seen, they would have been walking in fields, they would have been in Jerusalem, and they would have seen these beautiful grapevines with grapes flowing all across them. Just beautiful picture. So it would have been very familiar to the disciples. Now, when we think about the vine itself, because not everybody is familiar with the, the, the grapevines, but the vine itself is essentially the roots, the trunk, and the head of the vine, of the grapevine plant itself. And then from the vine, we have these shoots, these branches, and these small areas that come out, and they call those canes or shoots. And that is where the fruit would attach. Now, for many people, especially those on the Shoreline staff, they know that I love gardening. And for many of the folks at Shoreline, they know that as well. And so when I read this, I'm just struck. I'm like, how powerfully simple Jesus makes this. Because really, three simple concepts. Number one, the branches, whether it's the grapevine of any, or any tree itself, branches can only survive and thrive connected to the vine. The branches can only survive if connected to the trunk of the tree. Number two, from the vine comes life, and from the branch comes the fruit. But you can't get fruit on the branch if you don't have life in the vine. And so that's the second simple concept. And third is vines like tree trunks. They actually push the nourishing, the, the, the sap, the water, all the nutrients, they push it up and out to the, to the branches themselves. And that's where the fruit draws its source for power to grow. And that is the simplicity of Jesus' illustration. The branches receive what the vine gives. Very simple. And then we think about this personally then. How does it apply to the disciples? How does it apply to our lives? Well, I think Jesus' words, it gives us this beautiful picture of what success looked like, what true success looks like. And so I think as we read through John 15, we can see that there's three keys to success that Jesus illustrates. Number one, key number one, is to remain in him. Remain in him. John 15, we read 15, excuse me, 11 different times, Jesus actually uses this word, remain, or some folks have read earlier versions and they read the word abide. So whether it's remain in him, abide in him, Jesus is saying, hey, this is really, really important, and he repeats it 11 times. And what does it mean then to remain in him? What does that mean to us? Well, number one, I believe it means receiving, trusting, and living in the grace of Jesus. See, when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you receive the gift. You receive the gift of grace offered to us by God himself through Jesus. And in that, when you receive, you receive the gift of forgiveness of our sins. You receive the gift of eternal life. And you receive the gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who helps us, he guides us, he counsels and comforts us to grow to be more like Jesus. So we receive from Jesus Christ. And we're also continuously receiving from Jesus. We continuously receive his grace, guided by his word and guided by the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And it's also about trusting in him. Even in the most difficult and darkest times of our lives, Jesus is saying, remain in me. Imagine what the disciples were getting ready to face. And Jesus was saying, hey, remain in me. Don't get distracted. Don't get discouraged. Don't get disrupted. And don't get deceived by the work of the enemy of our souls. Stay focused on me. Remain in him, Jesus says. And I think it's also about living in continuous fellowship. Living in continuous fellowship with Jesus Christ so that we can experience all that God has for us and live in a manner that would glorify him in everything that we do in life. Now, here's the hard question. Well, can we have seasons where we, maybe we find ourselves drifting or we're not living out his will? We're not living in the center of God's will. And the answer is yes. For many of us, we've experienced that. But grace, it's grace that guides us back and it's grace that welcomes us back with open arms. And Jesus is waiting with open arms. He welcomes us back. It's his grace. And remaining in him is also embracing who we are in Christ and the hope that we have in him. Embracing who we are in Christ and the hope that we have in him. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, 
Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. You see, when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, not only are we, we're no longer defined by who we were, we are defined by who we are in Christ. So we have a new, we are a new creation, no longer defined by who we were, but who we are in Christ. And we're also not defined by our roles in our life. We're defined by our identity in Christ. Now, why is that important? Now, why is it important that we distinguish between roles and identity? Well, here's the reality. For many of us, myself included, 30 years in the military, I had many different roles that were changed, some by my choice and some not. And so some of you today are experiencing that. You have experienced that. Your roles in life have been redefined. But if you've placed your faith in Christ, your identity never is redefined because Jesus himself has defined you. And that's where your identity is. And in that, and out of the reality of your identity in Christ, your roles, and as you change roles, you become more effective, more loving, more compassionate, more effective in those roles. Now, one of the roles that I I particularly enjoy at this stage of my life is the role of being a grandpa. And, you know, as a grandpa, my wife and I, Amy, were blessed to have uh, seven grandbabies and one on the way. So we're excited. But as a grandpa, I, I get to often receive these original works of art. And they're just beautiful. And these I just treasure. And these are priceless to me. And I, I was so happy to get this on Father's Day this past Sunday. And also my wife, uh, she presented me. And you all be pleased to know that um, I have been pronounced as the number one grandpa. What a great honor that is. One of your pastors here at Shoreline is the number one grandpa. Uh, and I was really proud of that. And I came to work on Monday, and I realized that Pastor Dennis and Pastor Roy, probably a lot of grandpas out here today and watching online, you probably received a similar mug. So I guess I'm just one of many number one grandpas. But the bottom line is that our roles may change, but our identity doesn't. We just become more effective in those roles. And our identity in Christ also gives us purpose. It gives us hope even when our world seems to be in despair, or we seem to be in chaos in our life. Our identity in Christ gives us an anchoring point. And so today, I just want to encourage you as a pastor, as one of your pastors, if you've experienced a significant changing in roles, whether it's a loss of income, a loss of job, or maybe a reduction in one of those areas, I just want to remind you that you are not, if you are in Christ, you are not defined by your role, that you are a Christ follower. And we pray God's blessing for you and pray that in this season in particular that you would remain in Christ and hold on to who you are in him. I'm reminded of these truths as we also think about remaining in him is actively focusing our mind's attention and our heart's affection on him. That's a lot. Actively focusing our mind's attention and our heart's affection on him. It's actively receiving from him and being attuned to his presence in our life. I mean, it's so easy. We get so busy and so distracted in such a hurry that oftentimes we don't get the chance or we don't take the time to slow down, to quiet our hearts, to eliminate distractions, and listen to what Jesus wants to say to us, to speak to us. And so here's a redefining question for each of us is how might I more consistently set aside time in my day to spend at the feet of Jesus and be more attuned to walking with him throughout my day? I mean, maybe it's about redefining some of your daily priorities. Maybe it's about finding time with Jesus, no matter where you're at, what stage of life, we all need that time to spend at the feet of Jesus. Because out of that time, it will help flow. The rest of our day will flow out of that and it will be much more a beautiful day. Even in the hard times, we have to find that. Now, why is remaining in him so critical in life? Well, let me just give you a picture of my life. In August 31st, 2019, I had one of the most beautiful, quiet times with Jesus I've had in a long time. 
We had company in town that weekend, and it was 6.30, and I had the opportunity where I love to spend my quiet time, especially when I can't be in my study, and I can't sit in my comfort of my, my nice easy chair, but I had my cup of coffee, I had my Bible, and I went out onto our patio. And out on the patio, I sat there, and I was looking out at my garden, and there was my lemon tree in front of me with beautiful yellow lemons on it. I looked up, and there's my tomato plants, and there's red tomatoes on the vine, just beautiful. And there was this, like, morning dove. You could hear the morning dove just in the quiet, calm of the morning. And in that, I could just feel the presence of Jesus. And I just heard him speak to me. And in those times, I was preparing because the next day I was going to preach a sermon. And I just heard Jesus tell me, remain in me. Remain in me. 24 hours later, 6.30 on September 1st, I found myself in the middle of the most grueling hike I'd ever been on. My youngest son and I were at mile eight of a 10-mile trek up the mountainside searching in desperation for our second son, our adult son, Jake, who many of you knew and many of you were praying for. And as you know, the end of that story was an amazing, miraculous demonstration of God's hand of protection because the rescuers found Jake later on September 1st. But in that trek, remaining in Christ looked a lot different than restfully resting with him and listening to him on the cool, calm morning, the morning before. It was more about desperately clinging and holding on to his promises, being comforted by the Holy Spirit as my son and I were looking down every cliff, looking down in and seeing if there was any sign that maybe our son had, had fallen off and he, he was down there and he was hurt and he was, he was crying out to us. And we went and we just wanted to cry out. And in that moment, that's when you find yourself that remaining in him is both restfully resting and it's desperately clinging to the truth, the power, the person of Jesus Christ. And that's remaining in him. I believe the second key to success is bear much fruit. I mean, Jesus calls us to be fruit bearers. Three different passages in this, he says in John 15, 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's that key number one, right? Apart from me, you can do nothing. So remain in him, bear much fruit. John 15, 8 said, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. John 15, 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so what type of fruit is Jesus talking about here? Is he talking about peaches or cherries or those beautiful grapes that are on the vine? No, Jesus is talking about fruit that has eternal impact, eternal significance. And Jesus makes it clear when it comes to accomplishing anything of eternal significance, he's the only source. And that our fruit bearing is, glorifies God himself. It glorifies God himself, and it demonstrates the work of Jesus in our lives. That's the beauty of bearing fruit. And so how do we bear fruit? Well, we partner with the Holy Spirit in this process. One of those ways is that we grow in Christ-like character. It's bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, and 23 says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's beautiful fruit. I mean, can you imagine a life, those people that demonstrate, that have that fruit so evident in their life? It's just this healthy, vibrant, and it's attractional. And when we meet people like that, boy, we just go, there is something special about them. And what it is, is it's got the fruit of the Spirit. They are a Christ follower, and they're growing, they're bearing fruit, a beautiful picture. And so you say, how do I apply that? Then how can I grow in the fruit of the Spirit? And one of the ways I've recently just started in my prayer life is actually taking time every day to pray and say, God, help me, show me how I can grow in one of those fruit of the Spirit. So there's nine fruit of the Spirit. So one day I'm saying, Lord, 
Show me how I can grow in love. And it doesn't take the Lord long to show me. He, he does. He shows me that. And I go on down the list. So day one, I pray for that. And God shows me. And then what I do is I write it down. I write it down in my journal. And then what I do is after nine days, guess what? On day 10, I get to go, Lord, I celebrate the growth that I've had in this area of love and this fruit. And now, Lord, show me where I can grow now in joy. Show me where I can grow in joy. So I walk through. So each day, and if you get to the end of 30 days, if you do it for 30 days, you will have gone through the fruit of the Spirit three times and you'll be able to get love and joy. So I want to encourage you to take that 30-day prayer challenge and pray for God to show you how you can grow in each of the fruit of the Spirit. Bearing fruit is also about growing in spiritual maturity. You know, here at Shoreline Church, uh, we say that it's growing more like Jesus. And we actually have what we call uh, markers of spiritual maturity. And we have seven markers. And these markers are, number one is Bible engagement. How are you growing in knowing and loving and applying God's word in your life? The second is wholehearted worship. How are you exalting and lifting up the name of Jesus, praising God and exalting his name, whether it's in corporate worship whether it's singing songs in your car or whether it's just experiencing God out on the beach, thankful and grateful for all he's done, that is wholehearted worship. Number three is passionate prayer. How are you connecting with God on an individual basis, recurring all throughout your day, and how are you praying with and asking for prayer from others? It's growing in passionate prayer. Number four is humble service. How are you serving like Jesus, serving humbly, whether it's serving at the church or serving in some other capacity in our community. How are you serving humbly? Number five is joyful generosity. How are you giving of those resources that God has blessed you with? How are you demonstrating that? And how are you growing in joy in doing that? Number six is consistent community. Now, this one has been a challenge for many people, especially in the coronavirus, this time when we have to be socially distant. But there are ways that you can connect with other believers. And one of those ways is whether it's through online. And we love seeing that, that people at Shoreline Church have continued to connect in consistent community by engaging in many different online options. And number seven is organic outreach. How are you growing and sharing the love of Christ? How are you sharing the gospel? How are you being equipped and how are you being moved in your heart to go out into your neighborhood, into your workplaces and share the love of Christ? And here at Shoreline, we actually have a spiritual growth self-assessment that you can take. It allows you to see how you are growing and then it gives you some very clear paths for you to see how can I grow more in those different markers of spiritual maturity. The third way we can bear fruit is by growing and using our spiritual gifts. You see, when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you received a gift or gifts from the Holy Spirit. And each one is different, and each one of us, as Christ followers, receives different gifts. And the beauty is that we're given these gifts so that we can use them for the glory of God and for the advance of the kingdom of Christ. And so I look around at our staff here at Shoreline Church, I look at the volunteers that serve, and I am just amazed at how God has so gifted each and every one of them. But here's the reality. Each one is different, and the important thing is each one is using their gifts to glorify God. And I just think about this. What if none of our staff or none of our volunteers would have used their gifts? Right now, we would not be having this online experience. We would not be able to connect with you online. Today, we're also going to have our, we have worship service out in the courtyard. What if none of our volunteers were using their gifts, the gifts that they have to be welcoming and warm and, and helping people find spaces out in the courtyard? We have to understand we've been gifted and we need to be using those gifts. And one of the ways I want to encourage you is there's a lot of needs here at Shoreline Church. Now, even though we're not meeting on campus indoors, there's a lot of places. One area in particular, we could really use your help, and that is every Sunday we are setting up out in the courtyard so that we can have two worship services. We would love for some help for people who might be gifted in the area of service, that they could come and help us set up, and then at the end of those services, to tear down, to put the equipment back, and to restore the courtyard the way it was. 
We want to encourage you, if that's you, would you just send your name into our, our information, our connection center, and we'll get you on that team to help us set up and tear down. So the question we have to ask then is, for each of us, how might I more intentionally seek to grow in spiritual maturity and use my gifts to serve Jesus? Maybe it's we have to redefine what we've been doing, how we've been spending our time. Maybe it's we have to find some time to go online. So the spiritual growth self-assessment and a spiritual gifts assessment, our team has made those possible so you can actually go onto the Shoreline app right after service and you could take one of those assessments to determine what areas you are growing in and how you can grow more or to find out what spiritual gifts you have and then how can you use those spiritual gifts. The third key is love one another. I think for us, we need to evaluate where we're at in life and in the words of Jesus, let the words of Jesus move us to redefine how we treat and how we invest in others. Jesus says in John 15, 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You see, Jesus was telling the disciples that I'm gonna demonstrate the highest level of love possible. I'm going to lay down my life for you and for all the world so that they can come to know God, to be in relationship with God as they receive my gift, my gift of grace. And so we think about the word that Jesus used there, and I think what the message should be to us is Christ-honoring relationships are marked by sacrificial love. Sacrificial love. And that means sacrificially caring for and serving those that I lead. It's putting others' needs above my own. It's sacrificing time each day, whether I'm a a parent or a grandparent or an uncle or an aunt. It's time to pray, praying for those people in my life, my family, my friends. It's sacrificing time each day to do that. And one other powerful way to sacrifice, especially in our culture today, is setting down our phones and maybe even setting boundaries for our use of technology. Maybe it's for yourself. Or maybe you need to maybe lead by example and set boundaries for your children and yourself. And we know that for some people, they don't have children, but for each and every one of us, we need to understand that technology can do some some major harmful things in our life. It can increase anxiety, it can increase stress. And if we have too much and we don't have any boundaries, it can be damaging. So one of the most sacrificial acts of love we can can do is set down our cell phones, set down our tablets, set, set down our technology so that we can see the needs and see others around us more clearly. That is a demonstration of sacrificial love. And I think it's also about deeply connecting to encourage and equip those who follow Jesus. Simply put, in this season, we have to ask ourselves, how are we walking with and caring for those others, those other brothers and sisters in Christ? How are we investing time to connect with them and check in on them and see how they're doing, encouraging them in this season? Well, one practical way that I want to encourage you to consider is pastors Roy and Dennis, they've actually taken time to go and look at this passage that Jesus shared about loving one another. And they looked all through the New Testament and they have developed these short five-minute videos that are encouragements and also ways that you can demonstrate practically how to love others. So I want to encourage you, if you would like to to learn some new tips and techniques to do that, would you please opt in? There's a text you can text in for that. You can text one another to that number on your screen and you can opt in and receive those five-minute video sessions each week to encourage you to do that. And lastly, one of the ways that we can love one another is by joyfully serving together to help point people to Jesus Christ. Jesus says in John 13, 34 and 35, he says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You see, how we love one another 
it helps point people to Jesus Christ. How we love our families helps people see and helps them be drawn to Jesus Christ. How we love our neighbors, how we love our coworkers, how we love those people in our church, it becomes attractional. And that's one of the great marks of Shoreline Church. When my wife and Amy, Amy and I came here in 2012, we saw people, we were warmly welcomed. We saw people um, that were serving all these different capacities. The one thing that really struck us was how each and every one of those folks that were serving, how they loved each other. And they were enjoying each other's company. And that's a mark of a healthy and vibrant church. And that's what makes Shoreline such a blessing to so many people. So a question for each of us is how might I more sacrificially love those the Lord has put in my life and those, those that he has placed around me? Those that he's put in your life and those that he's placed around you. Maybe it's about redefining how you're spending your time. Maybe you've become so busy with so many different areas of your life that you've missing the opportunity to sacrificially love on those that are closest to you. Or maybe it's spending more time building in margin in your day so that you can invest in the lives of others to love on those people that you know need some encouragement, to share life with other believers in the church or with other people that you know are followers of Jesus Christ. And so as, as we wrap up this morning, I just want to be, I want us to be encouraged by Jesus' picture that true success, it's not what the world says is success. It's what Jesus, the creator and sustainer, your creator, your sustainer says. And in that, he says, remain in me, bear much fruit, and love one another. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the power of your word. And in a world where there's so much craziness and chaos and just so much despair and at times, it just seems so hopeless. Jesus, we thank you that we can come to you and we can draw deeply from your word. We can experience you. We can grow and bear fruit for you, to people, to be drawn to you. And that we can do this, Jesus, as we love each other and we demonstrate your sacrificial love to a world, to a nation, to a city, to our neighbors people that need to know the hope that is found in you, Jesus. So today, Jesus, move us from this out into our lives, and may we be different because we encountered you today. We thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, amen. Well, before I give you a word of blessing and send you out from wherever you're at in your homes uh, and your workplaces, or maybe you're uh, somewhere out on the beach enjoying watching the service online, I just want to give you a couple of closing uh, encouragements, if you will. Number one is this Wednesday, this coming Wednesday is first Wednesday. That means night of worship. So would you join us online, 615, and we'll be worshiping God. And in that, we'll be studying God's word. We'll hear a powerful uh, sharing from Pastor Dennis, who's going to share on the life of Isaiah, and also a man named Nabil Qureshi. You won't want to miss it. And also, again, we will take communion as we do. And so we're going to encourage you to join us on Wednesday at 615 for night of worship. If you need prayer for anything, if you need prayer, please call. There's a phone number on the screen. And also, if you would like to, you can email your prayer at prayer at Shoreline Church. And if you're new to Shoreline, thank you for joining us today online. We're so thankful you did. We'd like to welcome you. And if you would like more information on our church, if you would just please text the word welcome, W-E-L-C-O-M-E. -E. You can text that to the number on your screen. And that way we can welcome you properly to the Shoreline family. And if you have any questions uh, or you'd like any other information, please email us at info at Shoreline Church. So as you go from this place, as you go out into your neighborhoods, as you go out into your workplaces, as you go out into this world, may the grace and the peace of Jesus go with you. And may you go, remaining in him, bearing much fruit and loving one another. God bless you and have a great day.